Major General Henry Heath and his division were headed toward the town of Gettysburg by about 5 a.m. on July 1st. He had reports that Federals occupied the town, but he was unable to verify what size of a force opposed him there. Brigadier General John Buford and his division guarded the town, but the rest of the Union Army was on their way. He needed to hold off Heath and perform a delaying action until the 1st Corps could make their way to the field. He sent out advanced skirmishers to Marsh Creek. He deployed his two brigades across McPherson's Ridge, Colonel William Gamble's brigade on the left and Colonel Thomas Devon on the right. As the Confederates approached Marsh Creek, Buford's men opened fire at about 7.30 a.m., signaling the beginning of the Battle of Gettysburg. To give the impression of having a large artillery force, Buford spread out his six guns over the battlefield, two on the north side of the Chambersburg Pike, two just on the other side of the pike, and two on McPherson's Ridge, to the right of the 8th New York. Heath's skirmishers, which outnumbered Buford's five to one, pushed the horsemen back toward the town, but the stiff resistance by Buford's men was draining the rebel skirmishers, who had pushed the Federals back over a mile and a half by that point. Heath realized that this wouldn't be an easy task and deployed his first two brigades, Brigadier General Joseph Davis's brigade to the north of Chambersburg Pike and Brigadier General James Archer's brigade south of the Pike. Davis arrived first, but he was still organizing his force. What he didn't know was that the cavalry who were defending the ridge were about to get relieved. John F. Reynolds' 1st Corps troops were making their way to the field. Lysander Cutler's brigade was in the lead, crossing over fields and dismantling fences to reach the location of battle. Cutler split up his regiments, placing three south of the pike and two north of it. Davis's brigade was bearing down on the position when the 56th Pennsylvania leveled their rifles and fired into the 55th North Carolina. Stunned but determined, the North Carolinians and the 2nd Mississippi fired back. The 76th New York had not made it to the flank of the 58th yet, but they were hit by rifle fire anyway. Their commander, Major Andrew Grover, thought it was friendly fire and ordered the men to hold their fire, but another volley ripped into them. They filed into the line and they could finally see the enemy who had been firing at them. Their position had been concealed by the rolling landscape. Seeing that the 56th flank was in the air, the 147th New York crossed the pike and the unfinished railroad cut. A deadly firefight would erupt between them and the 42nd Mississippi. On the right, the 76th New York pulled back to their right to guard against the approaching 55th North Carolina. The commander of the Tar Heels, Colonel John Connolly, grabbed the flag of his regiment and with a yell rushed toward the enemy. He went down with a debilitating wound. The second in command rushed over to him. Connolly said, take the colors and keep ahead of the Mississippians. The rebels put up enough pressure on the flank that the two regiments were ordered to fall back. This left the 147th for the most part alone. They were nearly surrounded, but were ordered to fall back. Some of them miraculously escaped, but out of the 380 men who entered the battle, only 79 made it to safety, the rest having been killed, wounded, or captured. The 84th New York and 59th New York were in a tight spot. Davis's men were bearing down on them from the north, and Archer's brigade had began to cross Willoughby Run. Destruction looked to be their fate, but as Davis was organizing his men for an attack, the next brigade of the 1st Corps arrived, the Iron Brigade. The 6th Wisconsin filed into the right of the 95th, and together, all three regiments threw lead into the approaching rebels. After a few volleys, the enemy disappeared. They had sought refuge in an unfinished railroad cut. The Mississippians were now in a jumbled mass in the cut, unable to fire effectively on the enemy because of how steep the walls of the cut were. Many of the North Carolinians remained outside the cut on the north side. Lieutenant Colonel Dawes of the 6th Wisconsin saw an opportunity. He ordered his men to charge, along with the 95th New York, and they scrambled over the fences toward the cut. The rebels fired volleys into the exposed Federals, but they charged on. The 84th followed the other two regiments' lead. When the men from Wisconsin and New York got to the cut, they saw an entangled mass of men. The Mississippians were trapped. Some Federals called for surrender and others fired into the cut. Some of the rebels escaped, but many saw the futility in attempting to resist and surrendered. A melee erupted when some members of the Iron Brigade went into the cut and attempted to capture the second Mississippi's flag. Several were wounded in the attempt, but in the end, Corporal Francis Waller was able to subdue the color bearer and take control of the flag. He would receive the Medal of Honor for his actions. More than 225 Confederates surrendered in the cut, but it wasn't all glory for the 6th. They had lost about half their men in the fight as well. The destruction of those three Union regiments led to them seeking cover on Oak Ridge with the rest of Cutler's brigade. To the south, Archer's brigade was about to cross Willoughby Run and encounter the Iron Brigade on the other side. Since Federal commanders were having to feed the regiments into battle as they came up, this produced an, an echelon attack. 
the 2nd Wisconsin was in the lead, followed by the 7th Wisconsin, the 19th Indiana, and the 24th Michigan. The Federal regiments were ordered to load on the march and had to pass through multiple fences, which broke up their ranks. As they entered Herbst Woods, the 14th and 7th Tennessee regiments unleashed a deadly volley into the Badgers. It was around this time that Major General John F. Reynolds, the commander of the 1st Corps, was killed. Many of the Tennesseans laid down on their backs to load and rolled over to deliver their volleys into the enemy. Despite the destructive fire, the 2nd Wisconsin held on. Instead of the 7th Wisconsin coming up to their aid, they waited for the 19th Indiana and 24th Michigan to form on their left, before proceeding. Before they moved out, the 13th Alabama began to move in on the flank of the 2nd Wisconsin. Miraculously, the single regiment held on until the rest of the Iron Brigade surged forward. The 13th Alabama was stunned by the attack and gave way, exposing the Tennessee regiments to flanking fire. When the Tennesseans saw the Alabamians retreating, they were confused because they were holding their own, but with their flank threatened, they too were forced to withdraw. Out of the 1,100 men in Archer's brigade, 375 were casualties, most being captured, including Archer himself. Colonel Burkett Fry of the 13th Alabama would then take control of the brigade. The Union held off the assaults on the west and northwest side of the town, but now more Confederate brigades were making their way to the sound of battle. Part of Ewell's Corps was making its way to the field. Robert Rhodes' division of that corps reached the battlefield before early and prepared to attack Oak Ridge. The 11th Corps in the form of Barlow and Short's divisions were also on the field and preparing to deploy their troops to the north end of town. Major General Henry Heath's division under Lieutenant General A.P. Hill made first contact with Buford's cavalry across Willoughby Run, and it would be Heath and Major General Dorsey Pender who would engage with the Union First Corps under Major General John F. Reynolds for control of McPherson's Ridge. As the Iron Brigade and the other brigades of the First Corps engaged Heath, Reynolds' other divisions went north to extend the Union right flank along Oak Ridge. One of Lieutenant General Richard S. Ewell's divisions under Major General Robert Rhodes was moving south and would soon engage with the newly positioned Union troops of the 1st Corps on Oak Ridge. Lysander Cutler's brigade had tangled with Davis's brigade of Heath's division earlier and took up the position on Oak Ridge. Baxter's brigade would move to Cutler's right. Colonel Roy Stone's men had also engaged with Davis and pulled back to the Chambersburg Pike. Four of Rhodes' brigades were ready for deployment. Brigadier General Stephen Ramser's brigade was still marching toward the battlefield. Additionally, Rhodes sent another brigade under George P. Doles further to the east. As Rhodes' division was forming, he detached two regiments from O'Neill's brigade, the 5th Alabama to fill the gap between Doles' brigade and the rest of the division, and the 3rd Alabama to reinforce Junius Daniels' left. The reason he did this is unclear, but this put Edward O'Neill in a poor situation for launching an attack without two of his regiments. In a series of miscommunications, O'Neill ordered his brigade forward before the rest of the division was ready to attack. The Alabamians were hit by an enfilading fire from the 45th New York and artillery. Rhodes rode forward and ordered the 5th Alabama to support the brigade. O'Neill's brigade lasted only 15 minutes against Baxter's brigade before they fell back to the cover of a fence row where they fell to the ground breathless from a hard fight and attempting to avoid rifle fire. Brigadier General Alfred Iverson, seeing O'Neill's attack, moved his men out as soon as possible, just as O'Neill had fallen back. Iverson aimed his troops for the gap between Cutler and Baxter, hoping to break the line there. However, Division Commander John Robinson saw the situation and quickly ordered the 11th Pennsylvania and the 97th New York to plug the hole and move the 83rd and 88th Pennsylvania regiments west. As the North Carolinians neared the Union line, Southerners noticed as the troops bounded forward not knowing certainly where the enemy was, for his whole line with every flag was concealed, not one of them was to be seen. Baxter's men hid themselves behind a stone wall and relied on the element of surprise to push back the rebels. Daniel ordered the 3rd Alabama to support Iverson's attack and then Daniel himself moved his massive brigade toward the enemy. Meanwhile, Iverson's men got startled by the volley of rifle fire that seemed to come out of nowhere. The mini balls tore through the ranks. The Tar Heels, who had been battered two months earlier at Chancellorsville, was again taking heavy casualties. 
and Daniel's men were too far away to give them adequate support as they stood face to face with the enemy. Cutler's men took the initiative and advanced on Iverson, and the leftmost regiments broke and headed to the rear, leaving the 12th North Carolina alone behind a small rise in front of the enemy. Daniel was on his way, but he could see Stone's men hunkered down behind the Chambersburg Pike and had to split his brigade. He sent the 32nd and 45th regiments and the 2nd North Carolina Battalion against Stone and the rest of the brigade, as well as the remnants of Iverson against Cutler. While Daniel was organizing an attack, John Robinson, Cutler's division commander, saw the plight of Cutler's brigade and relieved his men with Gabriel Paul's brigade and shifted Baxter further to the southeast. On the Union left, Stone's brigade saw Daniel's men start to form for an attack and the 149th Pennsylvania dashed for the unfinished railroad cut. As the North Carolinians were crossing a fence, the Keystone State troops fired a deadly fire into the Tar Heels. The 32nd North Carolina helped in the attack, but again, Daniel's men could not budge the Pennsylvanians. They made a resolute stand in the face of overwhelming numbers. Eventually, the rebels were forced to fall back. An artillery barrage was the only thing that made the 149th Pennsylvania move back to the Chambersburg Pike. Daniel's brigade was new to the Army of Northern Virginia, but Daniel proved his ability when he scraped together the remnants of his and Iverson's men with the 32nd North Carolina guarding the flank. Ramser had finally made it to the field and Rhodes ordered him to help with the new assault by the entire division. The 30th and 14th North Carolina closed the gap between Iverson and O'Neill, and the 2nd and 4th North Carolina extended O'Neill's left flank. Whether the Union line could have withstood the assault that Rhodes' division was about to launch will never be known, because as they prepared to attack, the Union troops in front of the seminary to the south were hit by Pettigrew and Pender Southerners, and Baxter was ordered to help them. However, the Union line was collapsing on all sides, even north of the town. Paul, getting word he needed to pull out, knew that his men could not escape without being harassed by Rhodes' men. So he gave their duty of fighting a delaying action to the 16th Maine as the rest of the brigade retreated. The 200 Maine men saw the rebel juggernaut approach and delivered volley after volley into the enemy, falling back and taking cover and firing again. When they realized they could hold out no longer, they tore up their flag and hid it in their pockets and broke the staff in half rather than have the shame of getting it captured. The commander stuck his sword into the ground and broke it in two. Some men surrendered and some ran to rejoin the corps. But when all was said and done, of the 200 men who started the fight, all but four officers and 38 men were killed, wounded, or captured. After Archer had been repulsed around Willoughby Run, a lull came over the battle in that sector. North of the Chambersburg Pike, Robert Rhodes and his division was attempting to break the Union line on Oak Ridge. Meanwhile, the Iron Brigade, fresh off their victory against Archer, formed in Herbst Woods. The positioning of the brigade was awkward for the men in the wooded terrain, and multiple officers approached the commander of the brigade, Solomon Meredith, to complain about their position and suggested seeking better ground. Each complaint was met with basically the same response. They were to hold this position at all hazards. Major General Harry Heath prepared his division for another assault, this time sending in his other two brigades, Virginians under Brockenbrough and a large North Carolina brigade under Pettigrew. Colonel Burkett Fry, commanding Archer's brigade, would form on the right. The first to come in contact with the Union troops was the 840-man regiment of the 26th North Carolina, which barreled toward the Iron Brigade's left flank. The rest of Pettigrew's regiments advanced in echelon. A member of the Union brigade remembered that the rebels advanced toward them yelling like demons, and the two sides delivered volleys into one another at point-blank range. The 11th North Carolina advanced across Willoughby Run and gave further concern to the Northerners by overlapping their left flank. The two sides slugged it out, the 19th Indiana losing about 40% of its force and the 11th North Carolina sustaining horrible losses as well. One of the Tar Heel companies entered the fight with 38 men, but only four remained unhurt at the end of July 1st. Brockenbrough's brigade was slow moving, Pettigrew's brigade was one of the largest in the army, but Brockenbrough's was one of the smallest and arguably the least reliable. They would advance a short distance, fall to the ground to fire, then rise up to advance once again. The Virginians made two half-hearted attempts to engage the Union regiments in their front, but did nothing more. 
Meanwhile, Pettigrew's men forced the 19th Indiana to fall back due to pressure on their flank. The Iron Brigade's commander was wounded by an artillery shell, causing further chaos in the ranks. The only thing saving the Iron Brigade was the lackluster attacks by Brockenbrough that could have overlapped their flank and forced the entire group back. In the center of the Confederate line, the 47th and 52nd North Carolina regiments advanced across the fields ahead of them, letting their comrades deal with the Iron Brigade on the left. Fry's brigade advanced with them, but when they saw the 8th Illinois Cavalry on their right, one of the last remnants of Buford's regiments on the field, they turned toward the cavalry and watched them. They didn't attack. An officer in the brigade, disgusted at what their commander was doing, wrote that his men acted as a body of observation instead of attacking the enemy. Seeing the desperate situation, the 151st Pennsylvania was rushed to the front to hopefully hold off the Confederate juggernaut threatening every brigade on the field. In Herbst Woods, the 24th Michigan fell back and linked up with the 19th Indiana. The Iron Brigade was falling apart, and if it didn't withdraw quickly, it ran the risk of being captured. Biddle's Brigade, which had been sent to reinforce the Iron Brigade, but hadn't advanced far enough and remained behind McPherson's Ridge, barely saw the advancing Confederates in their front because of their precarious position. The 52nd North Carolina outflanked them, and a desperate fight ensued. The Iron Brigade was getting flanked as well, they couldn't hold on any longer in Herbst Woods and begrudgingly fell back. With the Federals on the run, the Confederate regiments fired at the pockets of resistance still present on the field. Both sides commented on the hotness of their rifles from firing so many times. Some Union troops dropped their rifles to pick up wounded and dead men's rifles that were cooler. A member of the 11th North Carolina remembered that their weapons became so fouled because of the black powder residue that they had trouble ramming the charges home so they resorted to picking up rocks to hit their ramrods in order to properly seat the cartridge. Biddle's men also fell back to the seminary. One soldier who fell back said the quarter mile run to safety was probably the best on record. This left the 151st Pennsylvania almost alone. Even though this was their first battle, they fought bravely and held on with the 142nd Pennsylvania. That regiment launched a counter assault that killed its commander and ultimately killed more men in the foolhardy attempt which contributed to them falling back in great disorder. Now the entire Union line was on the run, both sides paying a heavy price. The inexperienced 151st Pennsylvania lost nearly 60% of its force, and the 26th North Carolina lost 549 out of 840 men. Nearly a thousand men were lost in Pettigrew's brigade in about 30 minutes. Chaos reigned on the field for the Confederates as well. The division's commander, Harry Heath, had been wounded and knocked unconscious by a bullet to the head. The paper wadding stuffed in his hat probably saved his life. However, divisional command went to the inexperienced Johnston Pettigrew, and no further attack was launched. The Union troops did not go far. They were preparing defensive positions on Seminary Ridge. Heath's division was not without support, however. Major General Dorsey Pender's division was approaching the field. Colonel Abner Perrin was inexperienced at brigade command because he had just taken over from Brigadier General Samuel McGowan, who had gotten wounded at Chancellorsville in May. Pender made sure to issue him specific orders. Pettigrew and Brockenbrough's men remained behind McPherson's Ridge to avoid the cannonading coming from Seminary Ridge. Although the Federal infantry were tired, the Federal artillery were fresh and ready to unleash a hail of iron into the approaching Confederate lines. Before Pender's men stepped off on their attack, Perrin gave some instructions to his men. Men, the order is to advance. You will go to the crest of the hill. If Heath does not need you, lie down and protect yourselves as well as you can. If he needs you, go to his assistance at once. Do not fire your guns. Give them the bayonet. If they run, then see if they can outrun the bullet. They stepped off for the attack and immediately Federal artillery began launching grape shot at them. But as one South Carolina soldier remembered, they began throwing grape shot at us by the bushel it seems. They shot too high for us as the shot went over our heads. Had they been a little lower, I don't see how any of us could have escaped. Although the canister flew over their heads, the solid shot and shell did their grim work. A Union soldier remembered the 38th North Carolina who advanced directly toward the battery simply put their heads down as if marching against a hard wind when the cannons opened up on them, but they kept moving forward, despite the casualties. Lane's brigade, like Fry's before, had become distracted by Buford's cavalry to the right and only began to advance faster when Lane sent the 7th North Carolina to watch the cavalrymen. However, instead of heading for the Union troops at the seminary, Lane turned his men south, leaving Perrin and Scales to face the Union defenders. However, Scales ran into a sheet of flame and lead from the artillery and infantry opposing them. The destruction was so great that Scales' men had to fall back. They had been decimated, 
but the South Carolinians were pressing on. One member of Perrin's brigade recalled, to stop was destruction, to retreat was disaster, to go forward was orders. Perrin was angered over the lack of support, but he had a determination that led him to victory that day. He split his brigade, sending the 1st and 14th South Carolina to the left of a gap between Biddle's brigade and Gamble's brigade. He sent the 13th and 12th South Carolina to the right, the 14th and 1st fired enfilading fire into the Union troops, and one by one they began to retreat, streaming into the town of Gettysburg. Eventually the entire line at Seminary Ridge was gone, and the Confederate Brigade of South Carolinians stood victoriously on the ridge. Just north of the Chambersburg Pike, Robert Rhodes' division broke the Union line on Oak Ridge, and the brigades of Jubal Early were pressing in on the Union defenders north of the town. As Robert Rhodes' division pressed the Union Army from the northwest and the divisions of Dorsey Pender and Harry Heath attacked from the west, a fight also broke out north of town with a portion of Rhodes' division and the arriving division of Jubal Early. Since Major General John Reynolds had been killed earlier in the day, Major General Oliver Otis Howard, the 11th Corps commander, now took command of Union forces on the field. He sent the division of Francis Barlow and Schnofsky's brigade north of town to secure the Union line defending Oak Ridge. They were placed just north of town and in front of them sat a Confederate skirmish line atop a knoll, soon to be known as Barlow's Knoll. Behind the skirmish line was the brigade of Brigadier General George P. Doles. Barlow saw the knoll as pivotal and ordered a heavy skirmish line to be thrown out in front of his brigades. Then with Von Gilsa's brigade providing support, they pressed onto the knoll and easily seized it from the Confederate occupiers. But this action garnered attention from Dole's brigade and Early's division, which was coming down the Harrisburg Road. When Barlow saw the brigades of John B. Gordon and Harry Hayes along with their artillery, he called up for four guns to be brought up to the front to combat the rebel artillery that could easily cause destruction in the Union ranks. The 25th Ohio was then called on to support the artillery, but the vision of thousands of gray troops streaming down the road in front of him and Dole's brigade preparing for an assault from the northwest convinced Barlow to move the rest of Ames' brigade to the knoll. The Georgians were closing in on the Union position and advanced to within 50 paces of one another and fired volleys into each other's ranks. The lines were so close that the flag bearers from the 25th Ohio and the 31st Georgia fought one another with their own flag staffs. Canister from the Union gunners had ripped holes in the Confederate line as they passed over Rock Creek, but despite the casualties, Gordon urged his troops forward. Confederate artillery created havoc in the Union lines as well. The commander of Barlow's artillery, Lieutenant Wilkinson, was an early casualty when an artillery shell severed his leg below the knee. The young officer cut away the remnants of his limb with his pocket knife, but died later that day from shock and loss of blood. The brigade of Von Gilsa gave way first, leaving Ames' brigade to deal with the rebels who were advancing closer. Ames ordered the 75th Ohio to fix bayonets and charge the approaching rebels, but instead they advanced, and because they could easily get overwhelmed by the sheer numbers of the enemy, they halted and fired into them. As the Georgians swarmed over the knoll, the 17th Connecticut launched a bayonet charge, but it did little to stymie the rebel onslaught. The pressure was too great for the Union soldiers, and they began to fall back in great haste. General Barlow would be horribly wounded, left for dead, and captured by Confederate forces. The rebels captured the knoll, but were not content with just holding that feature. They were pressing onward toward the town. Shinovsky's brigade moved across the Carlisle Road. The 21st Georgia saw their movement and detached itself from the rest of the brigade to engage the Union forces not knowing exactly how large the Union force was. Once across the road, they turned north, and when the Georgians realized they were in over their heads, they fired one volley, then pulled back a little ways to wait for the enemy to approach them. The 21st Georgia hunkered down while the rest of Dole's brigade and Gordon's brigade moved toward the Federals, but the two batteries of artillery on the west side of the Carlisle Road let loose enfilading fire into the Confederate ranks, bringing death and destruction with every blast. The left of Dole's line and Gordon's brigade overlapped the 26th Wisconsin and sent the Badgers and the 75th Pennsylvania running for the rear. The Ohioans and New Yorkers fought on for a little while longer with the Georgians, but it was all in vain. They had to fall back as well. Brigadier General Shomifanig, acting 3rd Division commander of the 11th Corps, had already sent the 82nd Illinois to support the Union on the left, but now sent the 157th New York across the open fields to hopefully help the Union troops streaming back toward the town. 
However, they couldn't see the 21st and 12th Georgia regiments concealed behind the landscape. And like a swarm of bees, the Confederate regiments formed a semicircle around the New Yorkers. Confederate artillery on Oak Hill hit the New Yorkers from the rear as well. The men that could retreat did so, but the attack came at a terrible cost. The 157th suffered 75% casualties with 27 killed, 166 wounded, and 114 captured or missing. Around the same time, Rhodes Division and Pender's Division broke through the Union lines and the Blue Troops began streaming through the town. Early had Gordon's men take a rest, but advanced Hayes and Avery's brigades toward the town. Colonel Charles Coster's brigade was sent to hold off the approaching rebels, and they took up a position in a brickyard. As soon as Avery and Hayes came into view, the Union soldiers began firing their rifled muskets into the gray lines, but the numerical superiority of Early's two brigades engulfed the blue line. On the right, the 134th New York received enfilading fire from the 57th North Carolina, and they became the first regiment to fall back. Next, the Louisianians, under Hayes, outflanked the Pennsylvanians on the left, which forced Coster to order them to retreat. The 154th New York in the center did not hear the order and held out a little longer, until the rebels charged into their midst and took a great many prisoners. With the defeat of the 11th Corps north of town, the Confederate victory on July 1st was sealed. The Federal troops retreated to a series of hills to the south of town and began fortifying those positions. During the evening and night, brigade after brigade, regiment after regiment from each respective army made their way to the battlefield. Confederate General Robert E. Lee and Union General George Meade began to draw up their battle plans for the next day.